PAH TV coverage of Chess 2015 in Montreal continues. Thomas Baldrick, happy to have with us Dr. Vic Tapson, now of Cedar Side Eye in Los Angeles. How are you liking it there? I like it, Tom. I've been out there uh, for about almost two years now. Time flies. Uh, I still miss Duke a lot, but uh, Cedar's a great hospital, a thousand beds. We're getting some good pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary embolism studies going, so it's working out great. It's all good. Let's talk uh, about the informed study. First sure. off, why was it even necessary? Well, I think one of the problems uh, with uh, this disease, pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary embolism, this, this is kind of one topic kind of links PE with pulmonary hypertension. We know a certain percentage of patients with pulmonary embolism go on to get chronic pH, chronic pulmonary embolism causing pH, and, and could die from it. And, and they often are believe they're underdiagnosed, so we kind of want to get a better sense. We have some data from years ago from the Pengo study, a nice New England Journal paper, European study, that found about 3.8% of patients who have acute PE and are followed longer term go on to get pulmonary hypertension. Um, in the U.S., if you had, uh, we have a couple hundred thousand acute PEs that survive every year, there's more than that. There's, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of patients, which means there's got to be 8, 10, 12, 15,000 patients with chronic P in theory every year. So we wanted to get a better sense for how often patients were going on from acute P uh, to pulmonary hypertension caused by chronic PE. What did you find? So we found an informed study, and this was a retrospective study, mm -hmm. um, kind of hoping to generate some information, a hypothesis. The, the retrospective study, we, we looked at a health claims database and found about 7,000 patients that had acute PE, and uh, we looked at PE, pH symptoms, um, shortness of breath, chest pain, things that might uh, be symptoms in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Um, we extracted data on echocardiograms, caths, uh, right heart casts, uh, as much information as we could. We found about 6.2% of patients looked like they probably had pH after having an incident pulmonary embolism case. And many of them did not have any imaging follow-up. Many of them had symptoms of pulmonary hypertension without getting any, any imaging follow-up. So that was concerning. Um, and w so I think what we need to do now is we need to probably a little more data, more uh, solid data on what's happening to these patients. You know, follow some of the QP, how often they go out and get chronic PE, where are these patients. We have drug therapy for chronic uh, thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension now. We not only anticoagulate those patients, um, but if they're not candidates for pulmonary uh, end arterectomy, then we uh, consider uh, putting them on uh, therapy like Riosaguat, the only FDA approved drug we have now for CTEF. Um, inoperable patients or patients who are operated on and have residual pulmonary hypertension. So there's something we can do for these folks, so we kind of want to find them. What was most surprising about your data? I think the surprising thing was that 6.2% is a pretty high number. 6.2% of, of patients uh, with acute PE, instant PE, having evidence of pH. Now, what I have to say is we don't have as much detail on these patients as we would if you'd done a prospective study. But if it was half that number, it's still a high number, and that still means there's thousands of patients out there. You talk to my pulmonary colleagues, my cardiology colleagues, they were not seeing that many patients out there. So they're somewhere. They're getting um, diagnosed with PE and maybe they're still short of breath and they think it's because of their PE still. In fact, they may have chronic problems. Uh, so we've got to raise awareness, I think. Raise awareness to someone who has shortness of breath that persists after an acute PE. Do they have CTEF or chronic uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? Your opinion when you have a patient diagnosed with PH, what's What's next? What are the options? So the important thing with what I tell patients, um, we need to know the cause, we need to know the severity. You know, both of those and we can, we can start therapy. Very sick patients with idiopathic pH or have pulmonary arterial hypertension, they may get put on a parenteral therapy, an IV or a sub-Q uh, pump. Um, less severely ill patients, we can put on oral therapy. Uh, so that's really important to be able to decide on what, what specific therapy. We also got to make sure we do rule out other causes. So a VQ scan is one of the things we do in patients that are diagnosed with pH. Whatever the perceived cause, we do a VQ scan. It's a great screen. If it's abnormal, high probability, we follow it up with a CT. And if we find CTEF, we consider surgery. It's a treatable, curable condition. So that's the key, uh, cause and, and severity. What will you be doing next with this research? Well, I, I think what we I think would be great to do is get a prospective database. We have a CTEF registry underway right now. Uh, we're looking into doing a, a prospective study that's much like the Pengo study, taking piece, patients with acute PE and following them prospectively and uh, proving this hypothesis. There are a lot of patients going on to get chronic PE that we don't know about. So I think that's the next step. And uh, in addition to perhaps doing another registry or study, 
I think just finding ways to raise awareness, making sure we talk to our pulmonary and cardiology colleagues who may see these folks right. and uh, make sure they're thinking about this topic, thinking about the possibility of pH and referring them to a center that does pulmonary thromboendorectomy. Um, if the patient does have it. If they're not sure, send them. The CT scans are hard to read, Tom. They're, the VQ scans are easier. The CT scans, if you're not an expert in that area, trying to determine if someone has CTEF, if they're operable, is not so easy. So I think it takes some expert opinion. Very good. Trip to Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Be a nice little vacation, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Appreciate Thanks, Tom. Nice to see you guys. Thanks.